Hear me okay? Yeah. Great, I'll bless you, Terry, in a little bit. I, I, I come to you with a very awkward circumstance. We're going to do this panel in, I guess, in about 10 or 15, 20 minutes, whenever I get through the rabbit on. And I feel like I have a um, home field advantage. And so I don't want to get up for the next 10 or 15, 20 minutes and give my version of why I moved from theist to atheist whenever probably those things are going to be discussed on the panel. It, to me, would feel as if I was taking advantage of those few minutes. So if you'll allow me, I want to talk about a couple of other things, if that's all right. Is that okay by show of hands? Is that all right? Everybody's good with that? Good. How many have already heard my story? Everybody know me, Jerry DeWitt, heard my story? Just about everybody. Fantastic. Wonderful. I'm glad to not have to repeat it. I'm almost tired of it myself. <laughs> uh, but I will travel and tell it for money. So if you know of a group, you know somebody that hasn't heard it yet, <laughs> I will endure hearing it myself one more time. Um, I'm glad that you're paying attention, and I really, I truly, from the bottom of my heart, I know my heart's not the seat of my emotions. Don't give me any grief. I haven't had any sleep, okay? Um, but from the bottom of my heart, I thoroughly, thoroughly appreciate the support that I have felt over the last several months. If you don't know my story, just very, very briefly, I was a Pentecostal minister. The last half of my ministry was I was a pastor. And I came out as an atheist via this little thing probably you haven't heard of called Facebook. Um, back in October of last year, I actually stood behind the pulpit in a uh, Christian church for the last time in April last year. Then I joined the clergy project in May. I had the world by the tail. Probably most of you are not old enough to even know what that expression means, but I had the world by the tail until my boss fell under enough political pressure. I had already moved out of the ministry as an income into the secular world, the real world with the rest of you guys and had a real job all the way up until December of last year when political pressure forced my boss to fire me. So, that has put me on the road now, making a living by telling this wonderful, uplifting story of uh, loss and tragedy for coming out as an atheist. But it's also done some other things that I think are important, and it's, it's, it's not only unfortunate for you that I had to kill a few minutes because our keynote speaker is traveling this direction. But it's also unfortunate for me that I come behind great speakers like him, at, which I'm not going to mention because Sarah tried to get him to kiss me and he won't kiss me. So I'm going to talk about him. <laughs> she thought we could raise some money over that and it uh, sounds a little bit like blackmail, which is a crime. <laughs> Even for an atheist, it's a crime. I told her that was the last thing that my Pentecostal relatives need flying around the internet was a picture of me kissing him. It's like, see, that was the problem all along. So, not only is that an issue that I've had to follow him, but also, of course, Brian talking about the brain and PZ Myers talking about biology. So, staying in the theme of bees, brain and biology, I'm going to use my 25 years of experience to talk about something that I know very well. It's not the brain, it's not biology, but it's the bathroom. <laughs> Some of you may catch the pun. So, very quickly, I want you to go with me for just a moment, if you will. Several years back, I began to suffer generalized anxiety and panic attacks. Has anybody had that privilege in your life? Oh, look at this. Okay, I'm going to start a new group. <laughs> Atheist with panic attacks. And, uh, but this time, unlike Recover from Religion, there's going to be a membership fee. We're going to get this straight from the beginning. <laughs> um, so I begin to suffer with generalized anxiety and panic attacks. It's not something I've talked about in public before, but I think it's very important. And in the course of that, if you know anything about the way it affects your body chemistry, I have the privilege, the privilege of going to the bathroom numerous times a day. It became, you know, everything else revolved around that. Can I get some more brave souls that would raise their hand about going to the bathroom a whole lot? Not nearly as many. Y'all bunch of wusses. Then you the preacher comes out as an atheist and you can't admit you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> now we know what's wrong with the country. And so, in the course of that, it created a lot of different problems in a lot of different areas of my anatomy that I will not bore you with or discuss you by. But it led me to a wonderful visit with the doctor. 
that leads me to my point. So I'm in the doctor's office, and I'm explaining to him how many times I have to go to the bathroom and what pain I now suffer whenever I do go to the bathroom. And so he says, not a problem. Let's take a look. Okay, great. This is getting better. And so he happened to be a surgeon, and in his, in his clinic, he had the equivalent of an operating room in the back of his clinic. With one of these tables that are specially designed for you to kneel on and then be elevated into the air as if you're about to get your oil changed. <laughs> and I only wish he would stop the changing my oil. <laughs> and so here in total humiliation, almost like I feel at this moment, in total humiliation, it completely vulnerable, he says, now, Mr. DeWitt, if you need to, hug that pillow in front of you. And at that moment, for the first time, I noticed that there was a pillow in front of me on this table in this doctor's clinic. And I thought, I wonder why he would have put a pillow there. And about 35 seconds later, as I am truly combining pulling somehow through some force of fusion bringing the pillow into my very being I can hear him say Mr. DeWitt Mr. DeWitt there are other patients you're going to have to settle down because I'm screaming so loud and he says these words to me he says for just a few moments embrace the pain now kind of easy for him to say on that side of the procedure <laughs> But I had to. At that moment, for that moment, I had to embrace the pain. Now, why would I tell you such a gross story that probably, you know, will never get anyone else to hand me a pen in order to sign an autograph? <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this story is because since October of last year, those words have echoed in my mind, not because there was some strange guy behind me hurting me. That's not an issue. But because over and over and over, through this coming out as an atheist process, I've had to embrace the pain. Now what I would like to do is I would like to stand up here in front of you and I'd like to tell you how fabulous it is to be hated by everyone who ever loved you and knew you. And how great it is to be, to be somewhat popular among beautiful human beings like yourself, even though the payoff may be to lose the respect and the esteem of people that you have loved your entire life. I would like to tell you that all of this is rosy and beautiful here and ever after. But instead, if I'm going to be honest with you, and if we're going to shape American history, and make the future what we know that it can be. What I have to say to you this afternoon is, instead, man up and embrace the pain. Can I get a Darwin? <laughs> In September, before I really came out on Facebook, Dan Barker called me up because of my relationship with the Clergy Project. How many of you are aware of the Clergy Project? And this is get a Darwin out of you. We have over 300 members now in the clergy. Darwin. Oh, yeah. And so because of that relationship, Dan Barker calls me up and asks me to do an interview on Free Thought Radio, the radio program and podcast. And he assured me that it only played like at 3 o'clock in the morning in New York. Probably no one in my little boat up town of Dorito, Louisiana would ever hear it. It would be okay, even though it was a podcast and I wasn't completely ignorant. I did know that you could probably get them anytime, anywhere. And so it honestly put me up against a wall. Because I knew that by doing that podcast, by doing that radio interview, that I was drawing a line in the sand. That I was turning a page in the calendar or even the chapter of my life's book. And that I would at that moment be making a choice that would forever change my relationships with family and friends and with my community. And I'll be honest with you, I agreed to do it. It was going to be a, you know, a few days after he had called me. I agreed to do it thinking that there probably was a good chance that I would find a way out of it. But it seems like every minute every single minute after that phone call, this was playing over and over in my mind that this was actually a test. 
This was a test about my sincerity. This was a test about my humanity and my love for humanity. If I truly did believe that secularism was going to make America great, make it better, if I really did believe that religion was a hindering effect to our civilization, then who was I to step back into the shadows because of fear? And I knew that I had to embrace the pain. And I knew how painful that it would be. Now, the reason that I'm, I'm telling you all of this this afternoon is because I'm hitting a shift in my philosophy about things. Dealing with ministers that are trying to work their way out of religion and work their way out of having the funds and having finances through the ministry has caused me to work for months now on trying to create a, a good exit strategy for each and every one of them. It's caused me to try to find, is there a way to give everyone who wants to come out a safe landing? And maybe there is, and I just haven't come across it yet. But that's the problem. I haven't come across it yet. And I think it may be bigger than that. I think it's not just that it's complicated. That coming out is complicated and maybe one day we will figure out how to do it or surely one day we'll reshape society in a way that it won't even be an issue. But right now, what it is, it is the test that every sincere human being has to face. It's the test that every person with any type of intellectual integrity has to face. So I can't tell you that there's an easy way, that there's a quick way, or a painless way. But what I can tell you is that there's never been a people pleaser on planet Earth that wanted to please people any more than I. But I embraced the pain. I will tell you that I was riding high financially. I was bumping six figures every single year. I can't tell you there's a way to move in the atheist movement and replace six figures. But what I can tell you is that there's a way to embrace the pain. Because I do. I can't tell you that there's some secret formula, some, some really beautiful, elegant, apologetic, atheist apologetics, if you will, that you can say to your spouse or your loved one that will instantly make them understand and respect your position. I won't tell you that that exists, but what I will tell you is that I have faced the tears of loved ones who now reject me over this one issue, and I embrace the pain. And if I can, so can you. Can I get a door man? Amen. A door man. So, so what's it been like after all this time? Even with all of the friends that I've collected, with all the people who reach out with Facebook and through email, the power of the internet, I'm sorry, but even 10,000 new friends can't replace that one special loved one. Can't do it. But you have to embrace the pain. Because quite honestly, that's not a good enough excuse. It's just not. I've kicked this around in my mind now. I'm sorry to have you in such a serious mood for the moment, but I've kicked this around in my mind for months. This is an A important issue. Let me repeat that because I feel like I need to start preaching here. You probably think I already am, but you'd be in for a surprise. You've obviously never attended a Pentecostal church. This wouldn't even make a good testimony. This isn't just a important issue. This is the issue. This is the issue of our moment in time. This is our place in history. You're not building roots. You're changing the globe. I'm going to say it again. You're not building roots. You're not just creating some club. This is not just some social network that is passing its way through time. It's not just some form and fashion. But this is actually an intellectual right, revolution that is taking place within our culture. This isn't just a moment. This is the moment. This is the moment that if you're ever going to find strength, if you're ever going to do anything, if you're ever going to be significant to more than just your immediate circle, this is the moment for you to find your strength. This is the moment for you to face your fears head on. This is the moment 
to admit to yourself, yes, this is not always a pleasant process. But if that little Pentecostal preacher from the backwaters of Louisiana can somehow risk and lose everything, then you should say to yourself, I can embrace the pain. Because this is what we're called to do. Not called by some deity somewhere, some authoritative force that is somehow shaping history for their own purposes. This is a call that is in the hearts of humanists. This is what happens when people, through the power of knowledge, through the power of the internet, begin to realize that a skeptical nature is our nature. That is what is brought the human species to this place in time. This is where we begin to understand that free thought is not a new concept. This is our concept. This is what it means to be a true and honest human being. Is to walk out. And as Brian brought up earlier this morning, to look at the house of culture and say, yes, it appears to be blue, but I'm going to take for granted it's only blue on this side because I haven't seen all the sides yet. I haven't seen all the sides of culture. I haven't seen all the sides of possibility. And the great thing about making this process, the great thing about moving through this process and embracing the pain is that you haven't seen all the sides of you yet. You don't know what's possible in your life. And we don't know what's possible for America and for the rest of this planet. We don't even know what types of governments are possible because we're still tied down and fettered by religion. But once we're free from that, once we're able to truly have free thought making its way throughout civilization, then these things that seem to be impossible to answer, those questions can be answered. And if you don't answer it, then you're going to help the person who does. Because whether you end up with 5,000 friends on Facebook, or whether you end up seeing, you know, being seen on YouTube by 100,000 people or not, that doesn't matter. Because every person who embraces their pain moves civilization one step further because the next generation stands on our shoulders. And it's easier for them, and it's less painful. And one day, you mark my words, one day they will talk about this generation and they will talk about the culture that we had to work against. And it will be a smirk and a grin on the face of every historian. Can I get a darn win? intelligent? I really wish it was, and I really wish it was in my case. <laughs> Is it that we're all as tall and beautiful as me? <laughs> Told you I didn't have a lot of sleep. Don't mess with me. <laughs> no. I think one of the major differences is, is that we're not renting our lives. We're not renters with a landlord. We own our lives. How do you embrace the pain? Through pride of ownership. You embrace the pain by realizing that you own this life, you own this moment. And as far as we can tell, until PC tells us otherwise, this is the only life we've got. <laughs> right? And so we don't need to be renters here. We don't need to pass through this moment thinking that there's another bigger, more beautiful house ahead of us. We need to realize this life is our house. This is our dwelling. This is our place. This is where we'll make our mark. This is our moment in time. This is the true moment of change. What makes us different is we're not renters, we're owners. And if you're going to own your life, then own the pain. There's so many people just in this one gathering that I spoke to all the way going back to October and then in D.C. in particular. I won't embarrass anyone, but in D.C. I met a bright young man who carried this secret on the inside. He carried this secret that skepticism, that skepticism was his nature. 
and that free thought was his methodology, right? And that agnosticism, that that was his conclusion to this great question in culture. And that atheism was his opinion, and that he was a humanist, and that was his motivation. He carried this secret inside a Christian home. And so we talked about it, we talked about it, we talked about it. And we talked a little bit more over Facebook. And before it was over, he found the strength to embrace the pain and to tell his family just who exactly he was. And that, yeah, blue was one side of his house, but that there were other, other elements to him that were just as important. He's embraced his pain. I wish for him and for me and for the rest of us that there was some easy solution. I wish that a lecturer could get up and say, this is just how easy it is to do it, do it this way, do it that way. But you know what? If it was, it would have already been done. Because all these arguments and everything that, I'm not trying to be in any way disrespectful, but everything that we're going to talk about even in the next session, greater minds than ours has already resolved these issues sometimes hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The reason it's still here is because not enough people have chose to embrace their pain. But I think that the people in this room can make that choice. And I believe the people in this room can and will make a difference. Thank you.